David Morgan, thank you very much for agreeing to spend a few minutes with us. Um, I, actually, let's, let's reflect on, on, on focus groups, because clearly that's, that's your area of expertise. And, and, and let's imagine I'm starting my own research study and I want to use focus group methods. Yeah. Um, what would be your main advice to me? Well, I think what I always tell people is you, kind of, you have to imagine what you want to have when you're done and sort of have a goal that you're steering by and so as you're say reading the books or thinking about what you might do well it's what you might do so that you will have in the end okay and I would even think about you know who are your audiences who do you want to convince and you know that might be a thesis committee it might be a peer review or focus groups are you know very heavily used in applied research and so you might be thinking about how are we going to take this into practice but you need to sort of go through every step in the design as you think about who you're going to invite what questions you're going to ask them how you use the data once you've collected it for a purpose, okay? And I see too many people sort of starting at the beginning and saying, okay, well, I'll go here and then I'll go there, and they're kind of wandering about, and it's very hard then to get to the end point that you wanted to, whereas if you have that clearly in mind from the beginning, then you can make good choices. So that's what I think, particularly I think of uh, myself as interested in research design in general, and then with regard to focus groups, I always say, well, you have to know what your options are and then be able to make good choices with those options. And the only way you can decide how to make good choices is in terms of what you want to accomplish and where you want to go in the end. So that's, uh, I think that's really important and uh, I think many students kind of overlook it because they think of the method as so much about learning techniques and mechanics and nuts and bolts and those, I think of methods as tools that are supposed to accomplish something and the clearer you are about what you're trying to accomplish, the better you can use the tool. Does that mean though that I could right now go off and do a, a focus group without developing skills? No, of course you need the skills but they have to be in service of something. Uh, the research has to be about something, so that means that as you're reading the book and it tells you about ten different things you might do, well you can probably decide immediately that there are only two or three of them that you're actually that interested in that would meet your needs, then you can concentrate on those and begin to acquire the skills you really need. It's not as if you're uh, going to take an exam someday and need to know every piece of everything. Instead, um, you know, you have to be wise about concentrating on mastering the parts that are most valued to you. That's interesting. That's very valuable. And, and David, what do you think have been the, the main changes in, in terms of focus group practice in the last 20 years? Oh, I think it's been really interesting because, I mean, for me as a field, when we started doing it in the mid-1980s, uh, no one had heard of it. And we had to explain ourselves over and over. And then uh, just a few years ago, I went to a conference in Bournemouth, I think, and um, someone started by saying, now I'm going to have to apologize because I'm using a rather unusual method and it's not anything standard that you already know about, like uh, ethnography or focus groups. And so I was thinking, oh, I can, I can just, now it's so widely accepted. And um, our books are, are widely used, mine and Dick Kruger's, but they actually don't receive nearly as many citations because it's all covered in introductory text. So everyone knows what a focus group is, so you don't need to uh, do that. But I think aside from having become such a well-established method, um, the real difference is that in the beginning we borrowed so much of our techniques from marketers and marketing because that was the only sources we had and we've evolved things that are much more uh, appropriate for social scientists and we've learned that and many of, much of the advice we got was very good for the kinds of things that marketers were doing but they generally talked to um, you know, well, consumers could be almost anyone, you know, so if I want to find out uh, how to get you to drink, eat my breakfast cereal, uh, I once taught a course and there was a woman from Korea there and I asked her what she was trying to learn and she said she worked for a big American corporation and she was trying to help more people from Korea switch over to eating breakfast cereal instead of sticky rice for breakfast. Well, you can talk to anybody about breakfast cereals, but if I work has uh, been on recent widows and uh, uh, family members who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's, then we're really bringing together people who share something very deep in their lives. And that leads to a totally different kind of conversation. 
And we're going to think quite differently then about the kinds of questions we ask and the way that we talk to them and what we're hoping to learn. So as we've begun to think about the kinds of things that we do as social scientists, the kinds of people we work with and how our research interests fit into their lives, then we've learned really rather different ways to conduct focus groups than what we were initially sort of working from mm -hmm. as our starting point. And, um, you know, so I think um, sometimes the greatest privilege you can have in focus groups, I say, is to listen and learn. Yeah. And that may mean that as a moderator, you're not doing very much. And, and I often try to, particularly when you're working with people who are telling you about such important parts of their lives, if you can ask them the right questions, then they can tell you all the things that you'd like to hear without you having to do very much. You don't have to be steering traffic if you can kind of just generally lead them in the direction of talking about the things that matter to them and interest you, then um, uh, that's so much the better. I think, again, a lot of beginners in focus groups think that it's all about moderating and how you're going to create the conversation. And it seems to me that if you ask the right people to come and you ask them questions that they're just as interested in as you are, then they'll have the conversation and you have that privilege of listening and learning. So that's uh, my idea of an excellent focus group. I, now, I, I'm very pleased you said that, David, because one of my roles at SAGE is actually to, to train some of my colleagues in doing focus groups. And the thing I have to do more than anything else is tell them to be quiet, to mm -hmm. ask less questions and, yeah. and to listen. Right. And I wonder whether you could just quickly reflect on what the other kind of common pitfalls are for people uh, about to Well, I, I can tell you if people come up to me at conferences or whatever it is and say, oh, we tried to do focus groups and we had the worst problem. And before they say anything else, in qualitative terms, I've saturated on this, I said, oh, you blew your recruitment. And uh, that's that. And they say, yes, yes, how did you know? And because uh, people just don't pay enough attention to thinking about how are we going to get enough people there? How are we going to really get the right people there, the ones who are interested in our topic, the ones who can tell us about what we need? And so often people kind of think of, uh, particularly professional researchers, more than beginners, that recruiting is kind of a clerical thing. And, you know, you'll have some secretary make a few phone calls or you put out a few emails and then all these people will come. And, um, you know, it's really pretty easy for someone who says they will come to think, oh, well, all those other people are going, I don't need to. And so you need to think quite a bit about how you're going to find people, how you're going to talk to them and convince them, how you're going to continue communicating with them, uh, to, to thank them for coming and uh, give them maps and uh, instructions and calling them up and, uh, and reminding them, too, that their participation is really important. And, uh, you know, and, and so that they understand that and, um, and really feel appreciated for uh, the thing that you need most. But I think that is the, um, you know, in terms of the research as a whole, that's exactly it. And then the other thing is what we were just talking about, is the moderator doing too much. And particularly in the very beginning of the group. Um, I see that uh, when people are just starting out, if they ask a perfectly good question that everyone can answer and they hear like three or four seconds of silence, um, then they get very nervous and feel like they have to repeat the question and expand on the question. And then the more you talk, the more the participants will just sit there. What I would recommend, what I recommend to my students is that after they ask the question, and we've thought this through and worked it all out, it's something everyone can talk about, and then if no one says anything immediately, wait 10 seconds, okay? And I, what I'd advise the people watching is, get out your watch and see how long 10 seconds is, and imagine that 10 seconds of silence in a group. Most people think 10 seconds is nothing. If you had six or eight people sitting around a table for that long without saying a thing, it would be incredibly embarrassing to everyone, so they will talk. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, just a, again a thing that uh, the more the conversation belongs to the participants, the more you're going to hear the kinds of things that really interest you. That's right. Dave, David Morgan, thank you very much. That was okay. lovely.